nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So in the next section, I'm going to talk about how we can actually practically build uh, photonic waveguides out of what are called slab structures. So I'll explain what a slab is and then how it can be used experimentally. So uh, the key thing that's important about photonic crystal waveguides that I've covered so far is that those are all 2D. And of course, 2D is great for studying theoretically, but we, experimentally, we need to make a 3D structure because everything in the world is 3D. Um, and so the question is, can we use what we learned about 2D structures in a 3D world? And the answer is yes, to some extent. Uh, but there is a catch, which is that as we take our 2D photonic crystal structures and give them a finite height, then we actually potentially have radiation losses out of the plane. Okay, And the reason is actually very simple, which is that um, just like in a, a waveguide, uh, like we had before, uh, such as a fiber optic waveguide, um, then we're subject to uh, losses from a lack of internal reflection. So we need something analogous to internal reflection for uh, this kind of thing to work. So if you look at this picture here, this is just showing uh, basically radiation losses can happen here and here, which are basically all the uh, frequencies that are above the light line. So compared to the earlier case that we looked at, we didn't have to worry about being above the light line, but now actually that's a big problem. And the reason is basically because if light is propagating in this plane here, uh, but we are uh, basically not propagating fast enough, or basically k is too small, the momentum, then it can just go out, right? So it can go up and go down. So there's basically a lot of radiation out of this lab waveguide. So it's no longer uh, something that can guide light, right? So that's a problem. But if we move below the light line, which is kind of the region shown in yellow here, then we can have both a photonic band gap and we can have index guiding in the Z direction, basically above or below these slabs. And so this is kind of like a hybrid between the fiber optics we talked about earlier, as well as the 2D photonic crystal waveguide that we were discussing. So the slab waveguide is really interesting technology in some sense. And so this just showing like, you know, what it might look like. Um, there are many uh, implementations, so I don't want to say these are the only slab structure, certainly. But this just showing essentially the two basic uh, templates for slab structures would either be a bunch of rods in air, but I, probably the most popular thing would be the opposite, where you have a bunch of holes in a slab. And of course, the reason why the latter is more popular is just uh, the difficulty of fabrication. Uh, because if you create a, uh, an array of uh, pillars, uh, then it requires you to either uh, build individual pillars and then assemble them together, or alternatively uh, to uh, etch away a huge amount of material from kind of a starting wafer. Whereas in the second case with the holes in the slab, then it's much easier to uh, punch a certain number of holes through the structure, but you still preserve the majority of the wafer. And then also potentially it may be more mechanically stable because the wafer is still mostly intact. Uh, so you don't necessarily need additional support structures like you would in this uh, first case. Okay. Um, so just to look at what is the photonic band diagram uh, for some of these structures, whether they're uh, an array of uh, rods and air or vice versa. Typically you have guided modes that are basically below the gap as well as uh, extended modes that are above the gap, but still below the light line. And so both, both of these modes in, in the uh, below light line region are kind of analogous to modes that you might have in uh, fiber optics. But uh, here the difference is you can introduce a gap or band gap into the structure. So that actually allows you to tune the range of frequencies that are being guided in the structure. Um, so if you look at uh, what the field confinement looks like in the context of a slab waveguide, uh, here basically we're looking at holes. And so you can actually see that uh, 
If you look at top-down view at the magnetic field, it's actually strongly confined to a region which has a defect or basically smaller holes than its neighbors. And so that's actually very analogous to what happened in the 2D case. So this shows you that you can reproduce a lot of the same kind of guiding phenomena in a slab waveguide that you had in the 2D structure. But of course, again, you're below the light line instead of above the light line. And so you can see basically the slab modes are kind of in this red region that's shown here below the light line. In terms of practical implementations, this picture is showing uh, some of the recent work from IBM uh, of photonic crystal waveguides, uh, where basically you have an uh, index guided waveguide here, and then you have a taper into this uh, photonic crystal index guided structure uh, in the slab. Okay, so you can actually hybridize the fiber optics with index guiding uh, and uh, 2D uh, uh, localization of the photonic crystal modes. And you can all do all this using modern fabrication techniques at deeply sub-wavelength scales uh, for optics, like especially for 1.55 micron light. So of course this, this design is suitable for kind of like the, uh, the C-band and O-band type configurations uh, around 1.3 to 1.55. And uh, obviously it's a lot of work to design these structures because there are many design possibilities. So just to give you an example of how you can design this, if you uh, essentially just remove rods like kind of in a straightforward manner, and then you try to get light to go around arbitrary twists and turns, then you can see that in terms of the optical confinement, it's probably passable, but it's not great. You're definitely losing some of the power. But if you basically add additional structures around the corners to force resonances to happen at your targeted wavelengths, then you can actually greatly suppress losses. And so basically this graph is showing that you can have very, very low losses around corners if you add a few additional structures, which are shown kind of on these corners here. So there's one here and there's one here. Oops. And so basically you can see that both of these corner structures are very comparable. Um, another thing you can do that's really cool is uh, you can actually create add drop filters using photonic crystals. And so uh, this work uh, was demonstrated a while ago, but what it basically shows is that if you have light coming in at multiple wavelengths, you can selectively drop certain wavelengths into another channel. And so of course, this is just a simple example because it's just showing essentially uh, more or less one input wavelength and two resonators. And these two resonators create uh, constructive interference for light to travel in this waveguide and destructive interference for it to travel in this one. So you can selectively drop a single wavelength, but at other wavelengths, you basically get no drop. And so that can also be seen in this graph here. So this basically is showing transmission as a function of wavelength on the x-axis and then re uh, transmission to the second port or channel in the uh, second uh, subfigure. And so what that's indicating is there's a narrow range of wavelengths uh, where you have like very strong transmission to the second channel, but otherwise you basically ignore it. So that allows you to drop out certain wavelengths. And the other thing that can be done here is you can actually add tunability. So in other words, allow the uh, say refractive index of these two resonators to change slightly and then that'll shift uh, the wavelength at which uh, this uh, transmission is being uh, uh, ma ma minimized and the drop into the second part is maximized. And so that can all be shifted within multiple uh, wavelength ranges. So that's very helpful for uh, wavelength division multiplexing applications. And so uh, one other thing I wanted to show you is that there's also been some discussion about not just doing data centers, but even doing long haul telecommunications using photonic crystal fibers. Um, and so here basically uh, the key point is instead of guiding light uh, in uh, a high index medium, you instead try to confine it into low index medium such as air. Um, 
inside a photonic crystal structure. So basically what you're looking at here is called a holy fiber because it has all these holes and they're periodically arrayed like a 2D photonic crystal, but it's basically extended in the direction that's into the plane uh, that you're looking at. And so that can be very, very long, you know, on the order of kilometers potentially. And uh, that basically allows you to now have light guided in this so-called defect region here, which is air. Um, and so if there are applications where you need to guide light in air, say high power applications, then this is a very good alternative. And more recently, a uh, related type of structure called an omni guide was used uh, for high power laser surgery on uh, patients uh, that need a flexible uh, way to introduce high power laser without in injuring their other tissues. So this is actually uh, important for some therapeutic applications as well as potentially telecommunications. Uh, so going forward, there's a lot of questions about like basically what will the role of photonic crystals be? And so here's uh, one vision for the next decade uh, that was proposed by uh, uh, Baba, uh, who's a researcher in Japan. And so basically his perspective was that you may have holy fibers or other types of fibers, or maybe even conventional fibers coming into uh, these sort of uh, uh, optical telecommunication nodes. And then you'll have demultiplexing, which is all directed by photonic crystals. And then you'll have add drop filters, like I showed earlier. And then you'll have potentially like uh, optical memory and amplifiers to basically either store or increase the intensity of the incoming light and then you'll have basically processing of this data uh, through nanocavity cross-connect structures, and then in some cases going back into another uh, fiber. Uh, so then basically you would have many of these uh, nodes uh, at various points in the network, just like you have uh, essentially the sources and then repeater stations and then final uh, connection for like long haul telecommunications. So that was basically the, the vision for next decade. And photonic crystals could be an important enabler for a lot of these technologies. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a lot of work now on commercializing optical interconnects for data center communications. And it's believed that uh, this could potentially even go to shorter length scales as well uh, so that you could have uh, less uh, power consumption and also faster uh, communications uh, between even closer uh, points in uh, computer networking. Uh, so then basically, uh, arguably the frontier has shrunk, uh, where basically the initial goal was to use optical telecommunications for uh, global uh, communication, but then to shrink it down to uh, kind of like more local scales. So of course, across uh, US, for example, or across the state. But now it's actually looking at kind of what's happening on kind of the city level of how you can do optical telecommunications either within a city or like within like very large data centers that are uh, co-located. -loc um, and so uh, once you can, can achieve that, then it's possible to shrink even further.